Alrighty then. How are we doing with our stream? Okay, there we go. And I I am Chris from Air Windows and I'm going to try to do another coding stream with a couple of uh, modifications. Most notably, maybe I can make my uh, computer screen feed stop flashing all the time. I don't know. I'm not sure if it necessarily will. But what I've done, and hey, Wonderland, and I can see chat because this is not a music stream. What I've done is took some of the thermal material that I used to attach the ATEM to a big old heat sink and I made a little block of it and bridged between uh, the extension of the heat sink and the sort of HDMI end, which I believe is where the um, calculation is done, of the converter cable from the laptop. And if that works, that means it won't flash like crazy. So let's test that assumption. Oh. So here we are, and at some point I might try to fix up the uh, little window down there, but for the time being that's what I got. So if it's a cooling issue, then this, this screen won't flash brightly all the time. At least that is my hope. So we can do that. And I can uh, bounce the screen around a little bit. I don't know if that is actually changing a uh, video output or not, but yeah. So what we're doing today, I've had a cup of coffee and I've got another one ready to go. And my hope is that I can do a thing that I'm imagining called every console. We shall see. But the idea behind that is that um, I finished up a plugin called every slew. Actually, hang on. Yeah, so I finished up a plugin called Every Slew, and I'm going to be using that to do versions of Air Windows console going forwards, because what I need to do is get that up and running and start using it to dial in matches for the particular sounds that I get off of the recordings that I've made of these classic analog consoles. Like I've got a bunch of MCI records, I've got a bunch of Helios records, I'm probably going to go first for the Quad 8. I've got Neve records, although maybe not quite as many of those. Um, some of them I can play on stream, some of them I totally can't. For instance, one of the MCI records is ACDC's Back in Black. I have that album. I have captured it. I can't play any of it over a stream, but I can listen to it. And one thing that I can do when it comes time to try to do the MCI one, whether that be Bob Marley's Rastamon Vibration, or ACDC's Back in Black, or the first B-52 album, is uh, record music of my own and then try to sculpt it in that direction using the model that I, I make. Like take um, a couple of guitars and bass and drums and just record it in such a way that I have a recording. It's not gonna be ACDC style music. It might not even be 4-4, but what it can do is 
get tracks down, a reasonable number of tracks down, and position them in the correct places and start dialing in uh, EQs and things. Because of course MCI EQ is a special beast. The MCI EQ has some similarities to the Quad Aid, namely the crossover for the super high frequencies relative to the mids is kind of high. It's kind of just all sparkliness. And with each of these, there's going to be various amounts of saturation versus just plain boost. That's going to be a big deal for the, the super low frequencies. But one of the things that goes on with the MCI is that it doesn't really have a mid-range control in the normal sense. It has a peaking mid-range booster. And I should be able to do that with a biquad filter to the extent where I can dial it in. And I've got a bunch of examples. For instance, the Talking Heads records, like Talking Heads Speaking in Tongues. I am pretty sure that what happens with the kick drum in Talking Heads records is that they set up that mid-range boost control that is used in a more subtle way for a bunch of Eagles records and so on. It's used in a more subtle way on Back in Black. But on the Talking Heads album, I'm pretty sure they took that mid-range boost, cranked it up all the way, and dialed in the kick drum click. Because that MCI uh, mid-range sweep, it's just a narrow little boost, but it'll go all the way down to like 300 hertz and all the way up to like 8K. It's really quite extreme that way. And so if I can do a recording, I might have to take the front head off of my kick drum to do it properly, but um, do a recording, dial in an equivalent amount of insane mid-range boost using this little peaking control, dial it in to where, is similarly to my references off the Talking Heads recordings, Chris Francis' kick drum, and because it's going to be that. It's going to be that. And if I can replicate similar tones off of that EQ, then I can get that mid-range sweep right. Seeing as I have certain examples that really show off what that's supposed to sound like. And then it's a matter of, you know, both doing that, it'll be a little bit similar to like, my focus plugin where you can saturate a mid-range boost a whole bunch if it's a mid-range boost and it's kind of a peaking control because there's a series of harmonics that you get and if it's a mid-range setting even at 44.1k you're not actually going to get aliasing until you have enough harmonics coming out that they could start to cross over like if you had your mid-range peaking control at say 300 hertz and you were saturating it even you know at very low rates you still wouldn't be dealing with aliasing for a long time unless you had literal hard clipping which i wouldn't be doing so yeah so here we are in another coding stream and there's a particular thing i have in mind today as far as what I'm doing with the uh, idea for every console. And I don't know if it's literally going to be every console, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to finish it today, but I need to get it, give it a start. There's two things going on here. One of them is that I have a console version that's kind of waiting to be put out that's almost a little bit of an afterthought. And it's a little bit confusing, and I'm not sure whether maybe I should just not bother with it. Because it would be Purist Console 3. That being some variation on what Console 0 was doing. But I need to put out versions of Console that work better with people who do oversampling. That needs to be attainable. You need to be able to do that if you choose to.
Well, Purist Console, the original one, is that it is nothing but sign uh, and arc sign, encode and decode. Nothing else happens and there is no ultrasonic filtering. It's not designed to work the way that I designed some of these console versions to work. It's, this, it's the same guts of the algorithm that exists in recent versions of console up to console zero. Console zero is when I started using variations on this sort of sign style algorithm. I've seen people say that it was tan H and, and tangent calculation, which it's absolutely not. It's sine and arc sine. Um, but if I put out a version that allows people to oversample, I can strip that out and have it be separate. If I put out a version that lets you select between like a proper sine calculation and say the simplified one that exists in console zero, and I've got another simplified one, which is not quite the same as the one in console zero and does slightly more calculating. Thing is, the console zero one sounded to me like a Neve, and that's very interesting to me. So the question becomes, can I do a version of a console plugin where you can select whether you want it to be the channel version or the ver the bus version, whether you can s you can select different algorithms. Maybe I'll drag in like the older versions, console four or console two, stuff like that. Because in some of those, the encode and decode didn't really add up perfectly. But that's still what I was doing back in the day. And the question is first of all, like, do you want that? And it's a bit of a moot point because I might need it. And then the rest of it is, will it help people who are trying to use this tech to do um, oversampled stuff? The answer for that is yes, because it won't involve its own filtering type stuff. It, it's basically just like throwing my hands up and going, go ahead and use this in any way that you want. In fact, go and swap them around, experiment, do what you like. But that's also the tool that I'm going to need to do the versions I'm working on that are more along the lines of run this at 96K, it does its own ultrasonic filtering, it does it in a subtle kind of way, might do it in the same kind of way that I did on console zero. Um, it might also switch that out. Console zero was extreme and still applied the averaging even when it was running at a low sample rate. I don't necessarily need to go that far with it. But I should be able to put together this code and I'll spend like an hour and 45 minutes doing that. Uh, uh, some people have noticed that I'm also running into internet issues. I am on to some plans that will hopefully help with that. That's my hope anyhow, is that I should be able to come up with something where I can do better than the service I'm currently using, which is like 10 megs up, 10 megs down is costing me more than $200 a month and it's over copper and the people that I'm using are not able to commit to getting me fiber even though they're a fiber provider because another company owns the town that I'm in, apparently. And so the choice there is go and work with the company that owns the town that I'm in, let them know that, that, is, that I know about that and I know what they're actually, it's actually costing, and they shouldn't have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars running fiber to my location because that's why it was costing the other people to try to do that is it's a monopolistic type of behavior. And I don't really get a choice. And welcome to capitalism or a, a variation of it anyhow. But I should be able to set myself up with the owners of the town as it were and pay them less, less than what I'm paying the 
sort of out of staters, the out of towners that are not being able to get fiber all the way to me. And it's, I mean, the company that I was using 25 years ago, where I still have uh, email from them, uh, Silvernet, they um, are gone. They got bought out by this out of towner company. And there's nothing much to be done about that, but no point in clinging to old things necessarily. So with that said, let's jump over to my screen and see what we can start to make happen. This being, uh, hopefully, and I'm gonna reach over and touch the uh, HDMI connector. One of the problems I sometimes have with this tech is that with this video stuff, sometimes if it overheats, it starts breaking and flaking out. I have a literal ATEM that I allow to heat up too much, asked it to do too many things, and um, it eventually just melted down and could not function. I don't want that to happen to this one, so it's on a big old heat sink. And if the adapter from the laptop that I'm currently on, you can see my thingy moving. Um, if cooling that by providing a thermal connection to the heatsink is enough, then it won't be flashing and misbehaving, and that'll be kind of cool. I would like for that to be true. We'll see. Saves me having to buy another one. And that'll be nice because I got to save up for getting new fiber installed. One thing about that though, if I do get new fiber installed, I get to do a lot more video. I'll get to record and quickly put together video in like Final Cut on all manner of subjects. And then I can upload it and it would take a matter of minutes rather than four hours even uploading at the 4K that I like to use. You can join the rest of the world. It'd be amazing. It would be like I was not in America, you know? But um, for the time being, let's jump in and start making something. And what I'm gonna do is first copy stuff over from a different plugin. And I think what I'll use, firstly, we know what this is gonna be. It can be in mono because it's a end to end, um, it is a end to end audio unit for the Mac. And I'm gonna have a little section. Test tone button, nope, not right now. Not unless I expanded outwards into using the GUI framework Juice and had somebody who was making me one of those that I could use. And it would not be able to support, probably wouldn't be able to support older stuff. And that is important to me, so there's that. But um, I wouldn't be able to do that unless there was a lot more space to work in. And I don't have that kind of space in uh, generic plugin, so that's more well relegated to a distinct separate plugin. And there's other, you can get stuff that does those things, so we don't really need it. So we're gonna build every plugin or every console, and I've already got a every trim, and that involves uh, left and right and mono inside and stuff like that. That involves a variety of things that might come in handy. And beyond that, you are soon to get every slew because every slew is what's coming up next week. Not this one, but the next week you're gonna get every slew. And that's the one that I built that is um, platinum slew and golden slew and regular slew all in one rather than having 10 stages of scaling up the amount of slewing, it own, it lets you dial back to one or two or three, which means that it can run more efficiently, but that'll also change the sound. 
it will have the uh, frequency setting like you have in all of these different ones, but it will also have a setting where you can dial in the amount of uh, platinum slew style behavior, and we're calling that aura, I believe, unless I called it halo. I don't remember. Let's find out. I'm going to quickly run. Um, bring this up. This was my test. I don't think my screen is flashing even now, so that's good. There's a way that I can make it cut out, but I don't know if I want to bother with that. And then if I go to every slew, we've got this. We've got an inverse setting, which should be great fun. Depth is how many stages you do. So one is 10 stages of it, but you can do less, which will make a more efficient final result. And Halo is Golden Slew to Platinum Slew, effectively. So we can do crazy things with this, and this is next week. This might be good for something like an SSL or whatever, just make it be hot garbage. Do your smashing the S SSL sound. And dial in the amount of that. Do a little less depth. And so if I can make it so that it sounds like any particular console when you're just obliterating it, then we can do much less, at which point it starts to sound like the console you want to emulate. And you're getting that next week. But what I need to do to follow up on that is I really need to be able to get up a mix, whether that be in the box or whether that be um, across my analog console, which is more comfortable for me to work in. I need to replace it so that other people can have the same sounds. But I'm probably going to always have whatever EQs or things I make as a standalone so that I can get the same sounds I'm making these things do, but adapt them to my system. in part because things things like um, the analog mixing system that I've got, I've got the Bricasti, uh, oh, you might have, because this is an old Mac OS wallpaper. I just keep the same one, and I'm using this wallpaper for everything. I am a big fan of this particular sh uh, shapes and shade of blue, and it's a old school Mac OS wallpaper from I don't even know, like, lion or something and it's just my favorite one so it's on all of my computers and always has been it's the air windows wallpaper but um the idea with making in every console is much like how i did console zero and went hey wait a minute this is vibing like a neve why is that i need to be able to cross-reference all manner of different options like that do the full-on sign calculation, which might give me a smoother, sort of more tube-like, older kind of sound. I might need to do various trim levels of how hot do you hit the resulting output, or, you know, just scaling it in various ways. And I might need to do mismatches between different console versions so that, like for instance, maybe I get the ideal Helios sound off of going into a proper sine wave uh, sine function 
based encode like exists in Purist console, but then decode it using the console zero decode, or maybe the variation on it that I've also got, and stuff like that. Just same basic things, but tweaks to them. Because one thing about it is that I might be able to have a higher um, performance result off of using my approximations for the sine function rather than the full-on math algorithm. Because that's one where like I could do a long double calculation and it would come out as exactly the correct sine function no matter how long it took the computer to calculate it. Or I can do the much simplified version. So first thing we're going to do is open something. And we're going to go to one of our uh, channel plugins. For instance, here's channel 9. And we're not going to be using the code from channel 9, except that on the Mac, channel includes that little pop-up window that goes along with um, indexed uh, choices. So similarly to monitoring, it will have these various options and you select one of the options and it shows you what you got. I'd like the idea of having it be on the AU. It's a pop-up menu rather than some kind of slider to go from one thing to another because it is selecting different full-on console versions. That means that on the Mac I will be able to write up a longer description for what the thing is. But for we, we have to start with um, grabbing these. Oh, I just saw a flash. Are we overheating? I hope it doesn't do that too much. We'll see. I'm looking at YouTube Studio now, trying to see whether it'll show me up. Oh, yeah. So unfortunately, we still have flashing video. We'll, I'll see whether I can keep that to a minimum. Maybe it'll be better. I don't know. Channel 9 parameters to channel 9. Every console parameters. And if not, you just got to live with it, because I do. It's this. My actual screen is not flashing. It's only the stream. And I can hope that it doesn't do that too often or that it does it less often than otherwise. And we're going to set this up for now just as uh, maybe we'll have multiple uh, settings for the input and output drive. That might be interesting. Dial it in exactly right. Every possible, every imaginable console. We don't need to have these things, though, because we're not going to be using any of them. This is strictly about the encode and decode. And that means I'm done with that, and i got to go through into here. And let's see now. So yeah, we can already delete some of these, and we're going to rename some of those. But we need to copy this in. Get parameter value strings replaces all of this. And then I'm going to have to read I'm going to have to change that as well. And uh, let's see now. And we're going to copy this over, but not param 2 and 3, because that should stay the same. We're going to update that. And then we're going to delete all of this. You know, that kid, I would help if I knew who Satoshi Nakamoto was. Uh, 
Is that video games or is that audio coding? I wonder whether that's, or uh, a chef of some kind. Like, is that a chef? Or is that a game developer? Or is it like the guy that invented Roland or something? Because I do not know. That one's lost on me, unfortunately. Let's see, don't need to do this. But let's just... Oh no! Oh dude! N don't, don't do Bitcoin, it's not a good idea. That is, that is, that is a bad fellow. Or maybe he meant well, but he screwed up. He screwed up. He might be a Fed. How do you know he's not a Fed? How do you know he's not actually calculating just to mess with you? Don't, don't get into that stuff. It's bad for you. Let's see now. We do still need to do this. Let's not get distracted by dissing on Bitcoin or anything. And we're going to copy this stuff over. Well, not all of it. I don't need all of it. Yeah, I'm glad that I'm glad that that got a laugh. I didn't mean to hurt anybody's feelings or anything. It's just like, yeah, be real. And we're going to copy over this. Um, it certainly was never a good investment, especially now. I don't don't get sucked into that kind of stuff. Again, like I said, it's bad for you. You will find that to be increasingly true. Yeah, Dan Olson, uh, the YouTuber uh, goes by folding ideas. Watch his video on a thing called Decentraland. It's very funny to watch. And um, it's kind of like, yeah, you get to see the reality of what that kind of stuff sort of works out like. You know, it's uh, not not awesome. And if you're thinking in terms of being like a happy socialist left winger trying to help the world and those around you, like, well, watch what I'm doing. I'm not doing like MF NFT uh, plugins and stuff. I'm trying to put tools into the hands of people who can use them. And I'm doing it at my own expense. I'm earning money off of Patreon. That's great. Like I'm making better than minimum wage now, which is very cool. Although my livelihood still operates. So it's this weird hybrid between being a poverty person and being a person with good resources. All of the money that I make or that I've ever had goes into like gear and audio equipment because that's my passion. And uh, the rest of it, like my future is basically what I can produce. So there's that. And let me just continue doing this because this is also what we're talking about here. We are going to do some of this stuff. And immediately strip it down. But we're going to keep that. And we're not using that, and we're going to be replacing. This is going to live elsewhere. Yeah, yeah, you see, don't say that about every other decentralized project. Air Windows is a decentralized project. I was on like the Facebook Air Windows audio files thing, and there were people chiming up, trying all kinds of crazy things with my plugins or having problems and complaining loudly about it. Don't worry about it. Distraction is fine on Mondays. Mondays is fine for distraction. And there was a guy who was having problems because he was basically trying to do a Stephen Slate style post 2010s mix using Air Window stuff. And he's like, why can't I make it sound as thick and dense with artifacts? And, and he was using some Reaper user's magic way of easily instantiating millions of plugins and additional tracks and complicated routings. And he was like, why do I have 11 tracks? But then when I do the Air Windows thing, suddenly I have 80 tracks and my computer's dying. And I was like, that's because somebody else took what I do and ran with it. And they've made their own thing around it because it's open source and it's not centralized. And therefore, 
they can make whatever they want out of it. They can build like Reaper workflows of making things the way that they want it to be. And it's decentralized. I'm just not responsible for it. So yeah, you can have decentralized stuff. It's just a matter of how you're doing it and whether like people are gonna crop up being like, please help me debug my thing where I used Aramidos plugins and now I have 12 times as many tracks as I need. And I'm like, well, I didn't tell you to do that. Have you tried doing this? And yeah, I tried to give that person good advice. But yeah, it's some of the decentralized thing is important. Like the ability to do an open source project and have other people run with it in directions that you didn't expect is important. And that is decentralized because I exert no control over it. By the same token, those other people are not necessarily going to get results I like. What I'm doing today is about getting results I like. I'm going to be putting together every console so that I can swap out different variations on this stuff and eventually be able to put together like experiments on uh, classic big console designs I can work on in the box and reference my recordings, which I think these current people, they're really not interested in like firing up the Bob Marley and the Waiter Whalers album Burnin' and comparing it to uh, Traffic's The Low Spark of High Heeled Boys and figuring out what it takes to get the high percussion and cymbals on those albums to sound and vibe like off of those vinyl records because they probably don't care about vinyl records, not having grown up with them. They probably are not concerned about that. Or for, you know, by contrast, if you took stuff and went, what do I need to do in order to make stuff come off like all of the Steely Dan records other than Katie Lied, because Katie Lied was ruined in mastering. Um, the mix down was broken, so that's why it sounds the way that it does. But like Asia and Royal Scam and all of that kind of stuff, what does it take to be able to make stuff in the box come off not like say, Donald Fagan's The Nightfly, which was one of the first digital productions, what does it take for it to come off like the Steely Dan records as records? That really clear, but extremely analog warm and spacious stuff that had that flavor to the nth degree. How do you maximize on that? Well, people these days don't even know what that is. They're only hearing like streaming services. They have no idea, which is one of the reasons that I've showed vinyl records on stream before and will probably do so again anytime I want to risk like having my channel run into problems. So I'm sure I will do it again, especially if I get to where I can put up metering so that people can watch what that stuff registered like on the meters. I think that's important. And also, um, when I can do a live stream and like tell YouTube, hey, I'm streaming at 4K, let me throw a whole bunch of bandwidth your way and have fiber so that I can feed it that much bandwidth and just YouTube can go and restream or down sample stuff as it needs to. But yeah, I would like to do that kind of thing. And that is why decentralization is important and why Air Windows fundamentally is designed as a decentralized thing where I don't control all the outlying stuff. It just comes out from what I'm doing. Other people don't have to care about the things I care about. And in fact, other people are not producing. Uh, GYLP2 make a plugin that make Presumably exciting sounds. If writing, you must mean exciting. V is like next to C there. 
Make a plugin that make exciting sounds like old records. Dude, that's literally part of what I'm doing today. Coming up next week, you get every slew. That is a fundamental part of what I'm going to be building into new upcoming console albums because the console, uh, the, the console versions I'm going to be coming out with that act like big consoles with EQs and stuff built into them will all be designed to default to the sounds that match that stuff. Like you should be able to bring up the MCI version from Air Windows and you only get like a treble and a, mid, a sweepable mid boost and a bass and you adjust those things. I'm not even gonna have all the switchability in there. I'm gonna go with what seems most popular and keep it simple. When you adjust those things to match basically the volumes and the levels and the tones of what like Back in Black sounded like, you should get a end result that vibes like Back in Black if I have done my job. Like if you turned it up too loud, you would have it slamming the console a little bit too hard. And it would be like, I don't know, do they, do they slam the console harder for, for those about to rock? If so, it would come off like that. But um, that's literally what I've been working on every Monday and lots of the rest of the week. That is the whole idea. So congrats, that's exactly what I'm aiming to do. So yeah. <coughs> Excuse me, got a little carried away about there. If it isn't talking about Bitcoin and decentralization, you, if you tell me, hey, make a plugin that makes ex exciting sounds like old records, that's, that's my life work. That's what I've been doing this entire time. Um, modern vinyl doesn't lose everything, but you're not really getting all that you got out of vintage vinyl, partly because one of the things that goes on with um, people running modern records and trying to get stuff working, pro like by here. Oop. Here's a little data point for you. In doing my research on the variations of console, one of the things that I found was people talking about the old MCI consoles, like the M MCI 400 series. And the uh, 400 series and the 500 series were notable MCI consoles. I'm pretty sure your classic records tended to be like early on and they were 400 series. 500 series and beyond, you started to run into problems because MCI moved to a wave soldering technique, a sort of automated soldering technique, where the machine that they got to do it was not really adequate. And so if you get MCI consoles today, you could probably buy, especially a 500 series, for relatively little, but as these things go. And the reason is that you would have to take every bit of it apart and resolder every connection in the entire console. That could be tens of thousands of solder connections, all going intermittent and bad because the wave soldering was no good. Early 400 stuff, not so much. But one of the things that people say when talking about restoring old consoles like that is, yeah, you absolutely should do that. And you can replace the old capacitors because they will have dried up and gone wrong. Still fine. And you probably want to replace all the old inductors because they didn't have enough headroom. Okay, think about that for a second. Take this magic old console that hit records came off of that we know had some parts in it where the engineers are like, oh, dude, uh, I turned up the bass on this and it started to saturate and sound weird. Well, that's on the freaking hit records, thank you very much. But the engineers go, 
That's not supposed to distort. All I did was turn up the bass. We need to change the inductors of this desk and we need to make it so that it no longer does that. Well, guess what? A bunch of people did exactly that and their stuff sounds more like mixing in the box. Because they fixed the tone problems and the distortions and things that were inherent to these old, you know, the old consoles where it's like, Oh yeah, man, those old EQs, the the EQs were really weird. The inductors that they had saturated so easily. Well, guess what? That's part of the sound. You would mix into things like that. But that's what happens with stuff like modern vinyl re-releases is you'll have somebody, re I've got a bunch of Pixies records because I didn't have the Pixies records off of original recordings. I, I wasn't collecting them at the time. There's, I've got a bunch of Zappa, I've got a bunch of old records that I got when I was a teenager. And record stores were a big deal, and it was around about the time that CDs started coming out. So people started unloading their records. And I did have an opportunity back in the day of um, accumulating a record collection it used to be even huger than it is now but I, I became homeless at one point and thankfully a drummer in a band that I was running sound for his mom let me keep stuff in her basement and I didn't stay homeless for very long and I ended up being able to get my stuff back but I did have to dump a bunch of things like I dumped high school yearbooks that I'll never get back just a lot of stuff that I lost at that really dicey time in my life but I retained some of the vinyl records that I treasured so much. And those were not reissues, but the reissues are often done off of like the master tapes, which sometimes have degraded or whatever, through new mastering chains with like the digital delay loop in there before getting to the cutting head and newer, more modern techniques that allow them to push more highs and more lows and more volume through the system, clearly and less clipped. And so the modern reissues of albums are always going to be a little bit more DAW-like, even when they didn't go into the DAW and like clean it up in the computer and then cut that to vinyl even if they were staying pretty straight and clear, you still got like the, the pass through delay that's a digital process. That was happening very early. That was happening like late 70s already. Especially, certainly early 80s, you started really working with the digital stuff, but quite early on, they were doing a digital um, delay so that the cutting heads of the mastering lathes could have pre-delay for capturing peaks and things and space it out correctly. Before then, you were really limited to how much level you could put onto vinyl because you had to like calculate it out ahead of time. You didn't have a special delay that would let you clean, cleanly set that up. Instead, you just kind of had to deal with it. And so it was very, you couldn't put as much level onto vinyl because you wouldn't be able to space things out as accurately. Just a lot of stuff. So modern vinyl can be clean and fine and is sometimes a good way of hearing stuff. Although, I mean, there is a musician, Ben Jordan, who has talked about this, and I kind of agree with his point of view. Like, vintage vinyl has already been made. So there's you don't remanufacture it or anything like that. Where possible, making vinyl is a wasteful process. It pollutes. You don't necessarily want to make a huge deal out of generating all of this new vinyl, which is not necessarily, like, you could get the same sound as modern vinyl off of like 24 slash 96 downloads. You don't need to have the physical object. If it's the sound you want, you can have that sound off of downloads. Everything that I'm doing with Air Windows is trying to set people up to have audio that is the same as what we used to have off of these classic vinyl records. 
but you don't necessarily have to have the vinyl record. And these days, it's it's unreasonable to expect everybody should have a house with a room that you can fill with vinyl records. It's like, no, that's not fair, and it's not reasonable, and it's elitist expecting people to be able to dedicate like a cart stuff like that around. That's asking a lot. But, um, yeah, I, I see a new question. Um, Helpful tips on dealing with aliasing, generating a second or third harmonics, never get past the aliasing on high frequencies. Mark, people have different opinions about aliasing in that um, it bothers some people more than it bothers others, and it depends upon how much high frequencies you need to have in your mixes. One of the reasons I'm doing every console, or at least contemplating doing every console, because I'm not really doing it yet, um, Let's let's get a little work done on that while we talk. Shouldn't need that anymore. One of the reasons I'm doing every console is so that I can give people a version of this stuff where you can um, run the plugin inside uh, oversampling. And I don't normally like oversampling, but I've learned that there are people who really have a problem with aliasing. Possibly because they just like really bright mixes. I don't know. That's one of the reasons that I like doing my analog mix with in my studio rather than going fully to only an in-the-box mix is that I don't like aliasing either. And doing an analog mix on an analog board with my reverb being in the analog chain and just recapturing that is super immune to aliasing. I don't, I won't get any aliasing that way. It'll be nice. And I'm quite happy with having only 16 tracks to work with, which is another thing that the analog console is like. And uh, so depending upon like the Aliasing and high frequencies depends entirely upon, first of all, do you have those high frequencies to run into? And secondly, what kind of processing are you adding? Because if you make a simple plugin to generate second and third order harmonics, you're basically talking about like a sine function. You're basically talking about a really, really soft clip. That will start generating a third harmonic immediately and then you have to push it way harder before other harmonics have to start coming in. It doesn't immediately go to um, really high harmonics. Instead, they come in one at a time. <coughs> so what happens is you end up um, only getting obvious aliasing. Firstly, if you're not doing some kind of pre-filtering, and a lot of the stuff that I do on recent versions of console is kinds of ultrasonic filtering that are designed to somewhat address that. Like designed so that I can still boost and run harmonics, but it'll kind of, in a distributed way, it'll tend to suppress the uh, because if you, if you filter in a distributed way, you can end up with really steep filtering and really extended uh, top. There's, there's stuff that I'm doing. Everything with console eight and also console seven before it had to do with this, this uh, distributed filtering and needing to run at 96K. And I endorse that. I think that's a better idea, better way of dealing with it. But for people who need to run at lower sample rates or who are just really hardcore, not wanting to get any aliasing, the answer to that is you do the oversampling. And that's one of the reasons why I'm making every console. It's not going to have any filtering built into it. That will have to be entirely separate. You could do it with the, the separate plug-in uh, ultrasonic or hypersonic. Or you could just wrap versions of every console in an oversampling function and do that because it's going to be nothing but the distortion or anti-distortion functions and you know that's all that will be so it, it becomes a matter of how much do you want to get rid of the aliasing and what are you willing to sacrifice 
because what I learned from console zero was when you push processing as little as possible to the nth degree, that gets you a different kind of sound. And that's what got me sort of the Nevi style sound that I was uh, surprised to get off of that. It's something that I can continue to run with and I can design stuff so that if you put together a console mix the way that I do, you'll be able to get uh, end result sounds that may possibly have some aliasing if you throw high enough frequencies at it. Like if you have vocals recorded with an, uh, what is it, an AKG C1000S? There's particular vocal mics or condenser mics that are known to be excruciatingly bright and tizzy. So record with one of those, don't de-S it, and your high frequencies from the S's of that mic specifically could run into aliasing if you boost them real hard. And if that's what you needed to do for your music, you might need to resort to doing oversampling or something to just try to force that degree of unreasonable high frequencies through your full mix. That said, the classic vinyl records that people are talking about, like can you make exciting sounds like old records, that stuff doesn't have those high frequencies. It doesn't have those high frequencies to start with, and so they don't alias. It's very band limited, and that's part of what happens with the slew restriction. Like I could probably do distributed slew restriction and it would do a fairly good job of catching that stuff because what ends up happening is if every step of the way you're kind of band limited, you don't end up carrying through all of the high frequencies to just alias worse and worse. Instead, you have a more band limited sound and it'll be sort of more mid-rangey and retro and classic sounding. And that way you can maintain some of the benefits of under-processing or of not over-processing stuff. And that's when you start getting those old vinyl kind of vibes. The depth of it is maintained. And when you like 64X oversample stuff, the depth of it is not maintained. You've just done way too much over-processing. Sometimes you can do so much of that that it comes out the other side and sounds good again. It's possible that like 64X or 128X oversampling can actually go there to the point where it's like, oh yeah, this is so extreme that it sounds good again. I have I have seen a sample rate conversion. I used to use a program called Brick where you could set it up to have like processing windows that were 30 seconds wide. And it was just such overkill that it ended up producing stuff that sounded natural again. Go figure. But um, here is the thing with this. We're gonna leave some of these things the same, but we wanna start making these be console versions. We want that to be a trim control and both of the trims default to one, unity gain. I want to set it up so that I can hit these at various levels and adjust the in and the out of them. In fact, maybe, I can't tell whether it would be right to adjust the whole thing that way. Probably be fine. Honestly, I think 96K mixes are best. <laughs> Because if you do that thing where you're doing the filtering and so on, you can still capture the end result as 96K and put it on Bandcamp or whatever and legitimately say that you're providing 2496 content. You don't have to be producing audio to 40 kilohertz to legitimately call it 96K content because what's happening is the roll-offs that you're producing are not brick wall anymore. So when you, when you mix the way that I'm trying to do it, 
and you're doing filters, but the filters aren't necessarily perfect brick wall filters. And so you're ameliorating aliasing, but without utterly cutting it off completely, you're also still gonna get a slower roll off as you go past 20K. And as an end result, you'll have some legitimate content, some legitimate original sound, some legitimate harmonics from the processing that are well over 20K and are still fine. They can like leak through like a certain amount of overtone, a certain amount of third harmonic or whatever, as high as like 30, 35, 40K, just very quietly. And that can be appreciated and felt in the listening. So you can you can sell people 96K mixes and say, hey, this is my 96K stuff. And it's not the same as just up sampling a 44.1K recording and then calling that legit 96K. It's like, no, you're mixing. So your sort of overflow into the highs can extend and you don't have to hit silence at 24K with your 24K filter. You just have to cut it down enough that you have suppressed the level of aliasing to where it is not worse than anything else bad happening to the sound. Because that's the thing. People try, it, it's like noise reducing. It's like noise reducing in uh, when you're cleaning up vintage recordings, and I'm talking like 78s or whatever. And you go like, okay, let's do the de-pop, let's do the de-crackle, let's denoise this recording. When professionals do that, they do not reduce the noise to nothing. What they do is they pull it back and retain the spirit of the actual music and just chill out the distractingness of the unpleasant sounds. Because when you do something like that and you try to take the... Uh, distracting level of the additional sounds and cut it to nothing, cut it literally to silence, you ruin it. It's the same deal with digital problems. If you're trying to obliterate aliasing, you can obliterate it to literally nothing, but in doing so, you're going to destroy other parts of the sound. And I have a particular issue with the problems of overprocessing and don't like them. So I will never endorse like trying to obliterate al aliasing completely as if you're supposed to be able to remove that entirely in a digital mix. It's like, no, you, you got to balance it with how much overprocessing you're doing and how much you're retaining out of the original sound. That's the idea with that. So we're getting closer to being able to do something here. I'm working very slowly, but these streams, these Monday streams are for talking as much as they are for anything else. Hey, console's literally the kind of thing we're doing, so we'll leave it at that. We're going to make these go from zero to two. And we're going to change these once we start using them. We're going to keep some of this the way it is, but we're going to take out literally everything about them. Because this is going to become the variations on console. By the way, I noticed an interesting thing on my regular plugin videos. I have taken to using um, Clip Softly in them because I've got my microphone cranked up to the point where uh, it's uh, quite a loud output. And when I'm doing my plugin videos, sometimes I'm overdriving and need to stop it from just distorting the output. In Final Cut Pro, what I'm finding is that the literal microphone feed off of the camera 
is playing through normally, but then when I bring in processing, all the processing is happening at a 6 dB down point. Like if I put in a clip only or clip only two, in Final Cut, it's not clipping to zero, it's clipping to minus six. I don't know why that scheme stage the way that it is, but it is. So what I do is I take a version of my shifting a bits plugin that I can't say on YouTube because they think that I'm saying a natty word and do minus one bit. And then I put in clip softly and then I do another shifting of bit plugins and do plus one bit. And then I have a clip behavior which is correct for the output of Final Cut. And that's what I've been doing for the last two videos. Can't, can't do it in a live stream though, it's too complicated. Um, and uh, it's just a little note about how Final Cut works in case anybody's interested in using that bit twiddling, right? As long as the sh sound isn't in there, I guess. So yeah, what we're doing here is moving this. And then let's delete this. Replace this with that. Because we need to be able to gain states that surround. So that if I want the whole thing to uh, react a particular way, I can make it hit the input harder and I'm probably not gonna do anything of the sort most of the time because this would also be more processing. Every little gain change is more processing. I don't actually want that, so I'll try to avoid it, but if it proves useful, then we'll use it. We probably don't need overall scale in here at all. In fact, I doubt we do. But I'm not so worried about that, really. We barely need anything. But we're going to need to change these around. Because we're going to need two. Investigate the console plugins. So here's what's going on with this. This is the new version of console that we haven't seen yet. Probably can do it like the week after next. I'm gonna try to keep all of this stuff moving. And then if I hit this and hit space, so we're just looking at it. See, it says sign. And that's gonna be our purest console. And we're probably gonna to clip to the maximum of sign, which would be pi underscore two, that being pi divided by two. Beyond that, you just have full saturating. The original Pyrrhus console does it in such a way where if you saturate it even harder, it wraps around again and goes quiet. So it becomes a little bit like a uh, fracture or something. And Purist Console 2 is similar, but we have filtering and we have the clipping to the maximum sign. So Purist Console 2 included that.
and then Paris console 3 which you don't have yet but it's going to also be built into every console this is my more sophisticated version which we haven't actually seen yet I've got three different versions of a basically sign like saturation and anti-saturation first one is just a sign that's purest console and that's also what's inside all of your stuff like console 7 console 8 the guts of it are based off of a sign transform this is a simplification of it that has been adjusted so that see all of those dividers there those are all shiftings of bits hey so I'm gonna be better well thank you in return for paying attention to this long boring live stream um, these are all shiftings of bits these are all divisions by factors of two it's possible to do this approximation and get closer to what the sign is by doing and I wonder if I have that in here nope doesn't look like it but I have the equations for doing this in such a way that it's not doing divisions by two and is getting closer to what the actual sign is but what we've got in console zero let's go over to console zero and we got a bunch and we've got four or five and six and seven go over to this one that's the pan and stuff for that that's probably going to be part of the console versions coming up see where it says big fast sign channel stage this is a simplified version of what you saw elsewhere it is the console zero equation and I believe I let's save that yeah what we got in here and I'm going to leave it here for you to look at these are variations on what I'm doing like uh, this was the original console it's a way of calculating something that acts a little bit like sine and arc sine but it's not so we're probably going to include this as well like retro console it's a different calculation it's not really quite the same and then we've got our crude sign that's not what we have in console zero and this is a way of calculating a sine or arc sine that's an approximation of just doing sine or arc sine this is more than we're doing in console zero either in the sine or arc sine version and we've got a, a tan and an tan. I'm not using these. And then this apparently is what I ended up with as uh, this is the accurate one. And this is the one where the divisions are shiftings of bits. So this is going to be one this is probably what I've got in uh, purist console 3 and I will put that out but what we're going to do with every console is make options for all of these so first of all let me do something else just for a moment because I need to make a quick pit stop I'm going to need to drink more of my coffee and uh, 
before I do that, I'll be back in a moment. It's a live stream. I got to do a break. I should be back before that is finished.
Hi, I'm back. Like I said, it wasn't going to take the whole time of this. This is like a 10 minute. I see a question. Possibly a stupid question. No, there's no stupid question. Sometimes they give me ideas. Does using cosine or tan instead of sine have a significant effect on the sound? Most likely. I'm given to understand that tan or uh, tan H is a very popular distortion thing. And I think part of the reason for that is because it is a sharper corner than uh, using a sine. Sine is about the slowest corner that you can get on a saturation algorithm. As such, it produces high harmonics more slowly. It only produces third, and then it adds a little fifth, and so on and so forth. If you start using a sharper corner, like a tan or whatever, then you start throwing more high harmonics more quickly, which will also get you into aliasing territory more quickly. So, speaking of aliasing territory, let's figure out what we're doing with this. roughly in order of uh, use. So we're going to do the early versions with this. Let's put a little space in there as long as we're doing this. My dexterity is there. And then I'm going to want a zero bus and then two more. And I don't think I'm going to want to, we'll do it slightly more complicated. Maybe we do it in such a way that it's in order. I'm just figuring out what sequence I want these in. Maybe retro should be in the end. And we'll decide Yeah, cuz I could call it 3 channel and 3 bus, but it's actually purest channel, purest console three. So that doesn't really make sense, does it? So I have to figure something else. Hey, yeah, I'm glad you're liking Platinum Slew. You should probably like the one that's coming up next, which will be every slew, and I'm doing every console right at the moment. So if I was to call it sine, that's the math function. I probably shouldn't add parens. I could. I can just find out whether it displays properly that way. Zero can be minimal. Ten 
tempted to call it zero though because it is it is console zero we're talking about let's so in that case that can be there retro can be on the end just in case it comes in handy and uh, instead of calling it minimal what what do we call it because it's in here that we're referring to gathering stuff from this and it'll be in console 3 but it's effectively this it's this calculation here So one, two, three, four levels of refinement. And likewise with the uh, decode. So four levels of refinement. They're each using power factors. But it's not really a full on sign calculation because it's not going to be as accurate as that partly because the real math for doing this is here it's uh, in a sequence of operations rather than a single calculation and it's like 6, 120, 5040 and so on rather than what I'm using 640, 112, 1000 rather than oh interesting then 4 8 16 and 32 where does that even come from though Five seven nine. All added. Three five seven nine. So what did I have in not console zero, but where's console three? Buzz. Interesting. Okay. So I guess this must have worked. I went with it. Make some of this stuff go away for a moment. And in our final half hour of stream, I'm going to try to get something happening. But I, I, I trip up on these dumb things, like deciding what I'm going to call this option. Sometimes that's just how that rolls. I could call it refined. I could call it simplified. B shift. In honor of how all of these calculations are being applied to make it be more like a sign, but the multiplications are all shiftings of bits. We'll call it B shift E. So sign is the full on heavy duty math, getting it exactly right. And B shifty is the one that I'm using where it's doing four different stages to trying to get closer to the sign, but it's not using the actual math. Instead, it's using shifting of bit math. Zero channel is console zero, so I can call it C zero. And 
And then retro is from like console four or whatever. I'm debating moving retro elsewhere. Yeah, I can move it to the beginning because it existed before the other ones did. Boop. So there we are. So now we need to update all of these things to coincide. RC. RB. SC. There. So now if I use those and get them right, I will have uh, distinct options for each of these. And I have to update these two. Again in sequence. So, RC, RP, SB, Pretty sure that has to do with making the menus work correctly. Default value can be sign channel, so that'll be three. Or KSC. There we are. And now I need to keep this on screen while doing the other stuff so that I know what I'm doing. At least I'll do my level best to know what I'm doing. Where's my coffee? Give me more coffee. So we got this, now we have to update this. Okay, now it should make a menu correctly when asked. Note that it needs to be param1, which it is, so that's still good. This is all just fussing, and this needs to be updated too. Oh, hey, min value rc. And max value zb. And we can clean this up a little bit. Yeah. 
Hey, Lorenzo. And now we've got a place where we will, assuming that it builds, let's make sure that it builds first. It's an AU, old AU, so you got to build it twice. Oh, and we need a version. And what's up with this K-menu item SB? What's up with that? Did I type something wrong? Oh, I did. There we go. And I need a version. Every console. It built. So far, so good. It'll be a little trickier to make the VST version of this, but I'm not going to be doing that on stream. I'll do that on my own time. Getting close to moving over to my own time at this stage. So let's see, our gain trims, those are correct. Parameter unit indexed is working. Right now this doesn't do anything, but it should actually run. Let's test that assumption. If I run Twisted Wave, I think Twisted Wave builds its things. In such a way that if I select it, it's got to be audio unit, so it's here. Bingo. It gives you this. It gives you the pop-up menu because it's indexed and it's made to be little menu items. It'll do the same thing in logic. It'll do the same thing in everything that supports that. Failing that, it will give you like one through eight. No, no, no YouTube channel. Retro channel means version of console that I used to make channel plugin or bus plugin. And these do work, including the gain trims. So that's all good then. And they bypass themselves when they're set to one, so that's good. And so now I need to plug in the relevant things to each of these which is actually fairly straightforward. Maybe I can even do that before the end of stream. If I do that by before one, I'll call it a stream. But I will test it to make sure it's doing the thing. where I put this stuff. So recent project test console. I think this is all pretty straightforward. This is going to be console channel, so I need to update that.
can we instantiate these variables because they didn't exist before? Um, this this uh, version of macOS that I developed the retro plugins on is Snow Leopard. It's 10.6.8. So yeah, the whole the purpose of doing this is so that my plugins can run on older machines. That's what it used to be. Now we start going around to some of these other ones. For instance, Let's open it. Why not? Why not just open it? Amplitude aspect has to do with when I started introducing this stuff on, I believe, console six and was also applying it to slews, which ended up not working out super well, but uh the full resolution pi divided by 2. That should work. And there we have our simplest form of sign, but without the filtering, because this is the one without the filtering. back a little bit and we do the bus. Similar deal. Except with this we need to clip it to one or minus one because if you don't it blows up and crashes. Let's move this. X. Didn't mean for that to happen. And that would be our uh, traditional version, similar to all of the versions of console, like console 7 and console 8, where other stuff was what I was working around. So we got our retro, which is the very first version that came out. 
and the very first bus version that came out. And this is the one that carried me for a while. This also includes, I believe, console five, I think. Well, let's go find out. Did I have ArcSign yet or not? Yes, I did. So by console five, I had figured out that I could use ArcSign to literally decode what I did with sign, and it would give me exactly the original. And then some of this stuff is slew related, which was something I did not solve with console five. Now the shifty stuff is in Purist 3. And we will put that out as well. If I can find the damn thing, where'd it go? There it is. So that's my, uh, you probably haven't even heard this. You've heard console zero, but you haven't necessarily heard this. This is just a more elaborate version of what I did in console zero. <laughs> And I think it's probably a very good one, but we'll get to hear it soon. And we'll keep the comment. And then we'll cut that and paste it here. This one under the clipping, so I'm not quite sure what the story is with that, but we can assume that if it's meant to be signed, we can avoid the wave folding like this. It's not necessarily going to perfectly clip there, though. So I have a question as to whether I necessarily want to do that. But we'll see, because one of the interesting things about it is that I believe on Purist console, well, we'll find out. Let's finish this and do a bunch of experimenting. How's that? We'll see what it does. We'll see whether it breaks. Here's the arc sign. So in theory, unlike with the arc sign, I should be able to push this one beyond, and it won't actually break. It'll just do ugly things. But we'll find out. This, but we'll comment these guys out for the moment just to see where we get. Oh, wrong place. By that I mean I can have this here, but first of all, it's not going to be perfectly mpy2. And secondly, we want to find out whether this actually works without the testing. We know that with the sign calculation, it does in fact break. But we don't know whether the simplified versions break. And then lastly, our old fan console zero. And that one does have places to clip to. Calculate that out in advance, I believe. We'll simplify that. 
These are filterings, we don't need those. than stereo. If I don't get all these right, it will throw an error. So we were going to get all these. Come on, there you go. That's where it was. And then the same thing. Oh, I have no idea who Terry Davis or Temple OS is, but fair enough. One of the dangers in listening to me stream is if I start actually coding really, really hard, I'll start talking gibberish. Even if I listened to it, I wouldn't really understand what I was saying. Because I'm trying to make concepts happen. What is that? Oh, I've opened channel again. Why is that? I don't want that. Here we are. And here is our additional stage. Big fast arc sign stage. Console zero is code. You'll notice how simple it is in the fact that we're doing these calculations in shiftings of bits most of the time. So it's a very specific calculation, this one. This one's simplified to the point of ridiculous. Same deal. Yeah, I'm sure Terry Davis is much cleverer than me, but I probably know more about sound than he does. If he's an OS programmer and not a sound programmer. So there we are. That would be console zero bus. So now you know what we do. And it's almost exactly up to one. So it's almost up to the end of the stream. We listen to what we just did. Save, build, up. Oh, hello. Now what is going on there? We can't declare things inside here, can we? OK. Back in the day, I always used to define stuff in the wrong places, so we'll do it again. Cross this initialization. I don't know what crosses means here. I just know it ain't working, and I know it's going to work if I do this. Not only that, that screwed it up so bad that it couldn't even do the cases properly. But we have now fixed it, I bet. Got there. Oh, one little change.
And I'm going to put spaces in here as well. Might as well go whole hog with this stuff, right? spaced out a little bit. Hello, Dell. Dell. So, build. <laughs> so this should be every console. And we're going to take a moment and open up something, not Discord Welcome Home, let's do something else. Let's do this one because it has low bass and we might be able to hear saturation on it more easily. And we've got our meter here, so that should show us something. So doing it this way, we are now clipping. Whereas the peak's normally supposed to go up here. So this is in fact a saturation. Sine does not saturate nearly as hard. saturates about this much. And then we can cut the volume and distort heavily. So, our retro really kind of aggressively it does some weird behavior as this one does. This is what originally it was. Sign is just straight up saturating everything. This is a simplified. And this is console zero. So one thing I could do here is let's do uh, a big old sign. That's a deep note, but that should work. And we will normalize that and then distort each of these things into it. And we'll do it in a effect stack so I can have two instances. One of these. and one of these. So, so what we have here is saturating into console zero and then decoding it normally and properly. Oh, except for it's not supposed to do that, is it? And that's not supposed to do that either. I shouldn't set it to zero, I should set it to one. There we go. So here's console zero. Pad it a little bit. I don't know whether we're distorting the... No, it's not distorting too bad. Bit of a pop there. Now if we had retro channel and retro buzz, this is what that one sounded like as you drove it. You started getting something else.
that goes heavily into another harmonic. So that's interesting. Our peaks turned into something else. And then distorted like mad if you pushed it way too far. If we do regular sine and arc sine, we've got pretty much purely a sine going in, and we don't get much else out of it. But we can push it to the point where it starts to crap out a little bit. And if we distorted the bus instead, we just get a nasty effect there, so we don't want that. Then, the bit shifty version of it gets really interesting. We push it, and it starts getting louder. And then on bit shifty, I'm sorry, I'm saying the word. I, I, I have to be careful about that. B shifty. code acts interestingly. So let's see, set that to 1. Set this to 1. So way th the way this one works, this is the uh, purest console 3 that's going to come out. start getting a kind of result out of there. By contrast, console 0 does in fact clip, but it doesn't produce really the same result that the other ones do when we go. And yeah, there is some subtle, in the sign version, It's clipping fully at the correct point. We start hearing that. The shifty version does seem to top out here, at least with console zero bus. These are all versions of Air Windows console, so they all do an encode decode. It's a question of how they differ. Like console zero channel into bus clearly caps out at this point like it's stopping it's not going any farther whereas sine into arc sine We're going into a sort of a clippy zone, which is a little louder than it would otherwise be. And you can hear it kind of starting to put that in. And of course our retro one behaves quite differently indeed. Probably because I could clip it at a relevant place and make it stop doing that. Also, interestingly, I think I'm not actually clipping shifty here. So this is what I'm going to have to do for hours when I finally get things going and get ready for making versions is I got to swap back and forth between these various things 
and make them so that they are not simply like just plain heavy distortion or the opposite which would be heavy expansion See, if we ran this, what we would see on the waveform is not a clip, but an anti-clip. I'll demonstrate that now. Anti-clip. And that's how this works, is it's doing the clip phase, and then it's doing the opposite. And I now have a bunch of different variations that I could run on that in order to get the end result doing what I want. Because I'm going to be selecting among these things and figuring out which ones sound most like, say, a Trident Day Range console, comparing different options for each place and how hard we drive them with what sounds most like, for instance, with the A Range uh, Station to Station or Ziggy Stardust or Van Halen's Fair Warning. And all of that kind of stuff. Like, I've got Neve records. I can go, does console zero sound the most like what a Neve actually sounds like? Or can I swap in something else that makes it sound even more like that? All of that kind of thing. So we shall see. But for the time being, I think I'm done with the stream. I'm only about eight minutes over, eight minutes past one, and that's, that's good enough. Um, so what I'll do is I'll bid you good day, and I'll keep working on this stuff. I'll be doing another music stream. I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to do. I've decided I don't want to do another aggressively weird thing, but I might want to do another Zoxbox thing, because those are just fun. And I don't feel I fully got as much out of it as I wanted to. I wanted to do something a little more approachable, and I just ended up making extraneous uh, industrial noise, which is cool in its own right. But yeah, thank you for checking out the stream or for watching it on replay or whatever it is that you're doing. And I will talk to you later. Bye-bye.